And those of you here early for the Alan Ross Preacher session at 11.30, you're in for a good treat, actually. <laughs> Thank you for coming early. Um, I'm Raju Narizati. I'm the publisher at uh, McKinsey & Company. And I'm really glad to um, have all of you here for what's going to be an interesting discovery. And I say discovery because I think the two panelists today are um, among the least talked about success stories in local community journalism in the US, not just for their journalism, but also for the fact that um, they are a for profit, um, lots of revenue, actually profitable, but not really talked about. So you are here to discover why. Um, and as you can tell, two women founders, but also two people of color, again, very, very unusual in the US uh, context for sure. But before I talk about business models and how things have been, given it's a very international audience and may not be familiar with um, the model and the network. So URL Media is the network, but both of you also have your own journalism sites or assets as part of the network. So can you briefly tell us about the network and then what you bring to it, and Mitra, you do the same as well. Sure. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> it's the call and response tradition over here. Um, I'm Sarah Lomax. I'm the co-founder, Mitra's co-founder for URL Media and the president. I'm, and I'm also the CEO and president of WURD Radio in Philadelphia, which is one of the few remaining black talk radio stations in the United States. Um, URL Media stands for Uplift, Respect, and Love. And we launched URL in 2021, right after the, the day after, literally, of the inauguration of um, President Biden. And the tagline that Mitra came up with was, we don't want the next four years to be like the last 400. And so um, the idea behind URL Media is that we are a network of black and brown media organizations throughout the United States. We launched with eight media organizations, two of which were me and Mitra's media organizations, my radio station, WURD, and Mitra's um, newsletter, uh, Epicenter, and she'll talk about that a little bit more. And so we were two of the eight inaugural members. We've now grown to 20 uh, members in the network. And the concept is how do we create more economic viability and, and um, sustainability for black and brown media? And the idea was if we could come together as a network and collaborate, we're gonna share content, amplify each other's content to create more visibility for our content and also importantly share revenues because we know that uh, money is oftentimes the lifeblood of any business. And we also know that black and brown media are historically under-resourced, have been underfunded, under-recognized throughout history, particularly in the US. And so this was an effort to bring not only visibility and um, address deficits that our individual organizations might be experiencing from a revenue and amplification standpoint, but also to really allow us to imagine what it would be like to not just be in survival mode, but to actually have resources to innovate and experiment and grow through additional um, access to revenue through our efforts in URL media. So I'll just pick up on that. Um, everyone, hi, my name is Mitra Khalida. Good morning as well. Um, I um, think it's impossible for me to tell the story of URL Media without telling you the truth about launching Epicenter as a newsletter, which was it was really, really hard. Um, my previous job was um, as a senior vice president at CNN. And then I launched Epicenter as a newsletter in Queens because our neighborhood in Queens, the borough of New York City, um, was among the hardest hit in the world 
world in um, the spring of 2020 by COVID-19. And so we launched as this organic um, email newsletter because much of the neighborhood uh, was communicating by email for everything from finding, and this is going to sound very familiar to many of you, but you know, where can I find a ventilator, a hospital with a ventilator? Uh, both parents have COVID. Is there childcare for their children? Um, food insecurity, um, you know, fears over eviction. Um, and so we started a newsletter to really uh, communicate um, and surface needs in the community and solve for them. Um, coming from a CNN, um, this is going to sound very naive, but um, I realized what it means to be small on the internet. And Sarah and I knew each other um, from when I was at CNN. And so often I would turn to her as I was launching Epicenter. And I would say, how on earth do you do this at WURD, right? How, um, if people need something, but Google's search results are not going to surface Epicenter, how am I supposed to serve my community? And so um, this idea of we are beloved in our community, and yet, the forces of scale are working against us, prompted the creation of URL media. And so um, I do think it's important to understand each of our roles as operators of community media and how we bring that to um, address some of the challenges, but also see the ability to scale our um, each of our outlets. As Sarah mentioned, we have 20 today and sees that as an opportunity. Can we stick with the mission before I come to the business model? A lot of digital local journalism in the US, and a lot of it has come in the last few years, has been in response to newspapers kind of failing, if you will. But most of them have tended to look at it as our job is to be watchdog journalism. We need to cover the corruption in City Hall. We need to all focus on all the bad things, and nobody else is covering that. Both of your organizations and the network does a fair amount of that, but your view of local journalism is really rooted in the community aspect of it. A um, couple of days ago, um, Epicenter had a story about, um, um, I think it was a review of something, but they, in doing so they said, here's why it's so hard to visit New York, because public bathrooms in New York are like impossible to find. And they gave all of the ways to actually find public bathrooms in New York, right? So there's an element of both news as well as news you can use. But talk a little bit about that approach, which I think is very different from all of the local journalism that I've seen in the US company. Yeah, I would say all 20, thank you, by the way, for that shout out. I love that story. If, um, if you were visiting New York City, uh, besides texting me to find a toilet, you can look at Epicenter's story on this. Um, you know, I think all of our 20 outlets have a common thread of service to their communities. Really, this idea of service journalism, which kind of will take on different names in this conference, solutions journalism, utility journalism, news you can use. Um, you know, Sarah can take you to the history of the black press in America and how we've always been rooted in service to our people, right? Um, for an outlet like an epicenter, the story that Raju just actually described is an excellent example of accountability, right? There are public bathrooms in New York City. They tend to be locked or unusable or, and, and so much of mainstream media covers that as a gotcha story, right? This is the problem. And then you sort of surface the problem and then you hope that policymakers react to it. I would say that the journalism that many of our partners practice, including Epicenter, is much more pragmatic. It's, this is a problem. Here's how to circumvent systems. And it's not a coincidence that's a network for black and brown communities. Here's how to circumvent systems that are not working for us or that are not made for us. Yeah, if I could just add on to that, because I think that one of the things that is so unique about uh, the URL network is that we are not just multiracial, but we're multi-platform. And so we are radio, we're podcasts, we're newsletter, we're live stream, um, we're newspaper. It's, it's a very dynamic mix. And that too speaks to service to the community. Because like in Philadelphia, I run a radio station uh, almost 60% of the Philadelphia black community and, and in the community in general are low literate. And so how do you make sure you have an informed 
populace if all you have is a, is a medium that you have to read. And so it's really important for us in this effort to create service journalism that we, uh, we reach people where they can access the, the information. And so, um, you know, again, our 20 outlets go across so many different platforms, but uh, the, the common thread is being responsive and understanding your audience and being trusted and beloved by your community in a way that they, you know, you, you overcome a lot of the barriers that exist in traditional media where many times black and brown communities have felt disenfranchised, overlooked, marginalized, caricatured in mainstream media. And so we are really an, a, um, an alternative to that throughout the network. The most contrarian thing that both of you did was when, again, the journalism world in particular was saying all of the answers lie in perhaps nonprofit and a lot of money has come into nonprofit models, especially in local journalism. You actually chose to go the other way. Right? It's a clearly for-profit model. Um, talk a little bit about the just thinking behind that, and then we'll get a little bit into how has it worked. Sure. <clears throat> so this was, I mean, Mitra and I, you know, we met at this program, the Media Transformation Challenge. We did not know each other deeply when we went into business together. But fortunately, we have been so aligned philosophically across so many um, fundamental aspects of the business, one of them being for-profit versus non-profit. And for me, I've been like a dog with a bone about for-profit because I really believe that addressing the wealth gap, the racial wealth gap in the United States, the for-profit Avenue is a way to address the persistent, chronic racial wealth gap that exists. You know, I I could cite all kinds of statistics in terms of the 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 the, the gap and how wide it is for particularly for Black Americans. And so we, it, at least I have always been feeling like part of URL's mission is to disrupt kind of the, the, the capitalistic system that has prioritized and privileged white males at the top of the food chain. And we don't want black and brown media to always be perceived as charitable, as a, as a, um, you know, a hookup, but as a sound, powerful, profitable business that can actually grow and sustain living wage jobs and can actually potentially create wealth in our communities, not just for URL, but for our partners as well. I would just add, um, I think one piece of being for profit is that not just early on, but throughout the two plus year journey um, that we've been on, we've had to prove our value at every turn. And I think that is a piece of what's missing in not just the nonprofit versus for-profit conversation, but in kind of the journalism startup, um, or even if you look at some of the language of why you should subscribe to media, it tends to be um, don't let democracy fail or you owe us this. And for us, we really focus on our value proposition to the user, to the audience, to our communities. Um, and I think that's an important part of our framework. Um, the other piece that Sarah um, you know, is getting at is that we really do believe that social justice and wealth creation not just can go hand in hand, but must go hand in hand. And so for us, the for-profit mission is not separate from our desire to change the world. It actually is a recognition that sometimes in order to change the world, you must be as powerful and wealthy as possible. And thank you. Um, and so uh, I just want to acknowledge that I heard you there. Um, and so that um, has created a for-profit organization. But I want to make sure that I mention of the 20 partners, many of them are nonprofit. Right? We are essentially a B2B network, and so we are serving a customer as well. Right? Our partners, some of them might be nonprofit. Some of the dollars, and I bet Raj is about to ask us about the diversified revenue model, but philanthropy very much does play a role in um, that vision that Sarah and I just outlined. 
you get to philanthropy in a second. Two years in, sounds like you know you have big ambitions, you're gonna be different and you've executed on that. The network has grown, so that's proof that people are wanting to come and join this. But give the audience some numbers. What, what is, how should we look at success in the last two years? We, didn't, we were not prepared for this question. So Sarah and I are looking at each other like, um, well, I mean, obviously the network has grown from eight to 20 members um, and, and growing. You know, we have a process for evaluating uh, new members and, you know, uh, has how we grow the, the network very purposefully. So that is one metric that has uh, shown growth. Our revenues, we, have, we do have a diversified revenue model. It's the, there's three primary buckets, uh, philanthropy, advertising, and recruitment, which, is, which Mitra can speak to, uh, which is very much our B2B arm. But um, our revenues have grown. You know, like, like I want to really stress that this is an experiment. It's a bold experiment. We are learning something new just about every day. I would not. And I don't want anyone out there to think that we are sitting up here saying definitively that we have the answer, because there are many ans answers. And we are um, having success in executing on an idea that we conceptualized three years ago. And it is incredibly redeeming that the elements, this idea, is working. All the pieces that we thought about, how do we share revenue? How do we share content? How do we amplify each other's content? How do we create a, a, an organization that at its core is about creating greater sustainability and an opportunity for black and brown media organizations? And we have, I think, check, 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 check. So our revenues, you know, and, and very honestly, our advertising piece was, it, it was slow to, to happen. And we were, there was, there was, it was almost a year into our founding when we were like, okay, okay, is this gonna happen? On the, because that was a fundamental part of our model was to be able to share advertising revenues with our partners to create more economic viability. And it took a while because it's a new concept it's, it's, you know, a lot of agencies, ad agencies are focused on just black or just Native American or just Latino. And here we were, this like diversified, multiracial, multicultural network. We didn't fit into any easy category. And so we, it took us almost a year just to educate and, and, and pers you know, persuade and leverage relationships, everything that we had to do to get a breakthrough on the advertising side. And we finally did in the third quarter of 2022. And it just kind of opened, you know, it just burst open. And so that part of the business was validated as well. And so now, um, I mean, I don't know if we want to talk numbers, but our each part of the business has contributed to our profitability um, in, in the two years that we've been in operation. Um, I'll just give you, um, I'll sort of rattle off some successes um, to the question here. Um, so our revenues are in the millions of dollars, and so I think that in itself is a success story. I feel comfortable saying that. Sarah just gave you a sense of the three legs um, of where our money's coming from. Um, I think it's worth noting at present, philanthropy is actually the smallest piece, meaning we are generating revenue from the um, recruitment arm, which I'll talk about in a moment, and advertising. Um, I think the recruitment arm is a success story because it's an example of listening to the marketplace and figuring out what could be our value proposition. So when URL was launched, we thought we would be more of a syndication network. And in the process of meeting with mainstream newsrooms to say, do you want our content? Here's how it could work. They came to us and said, actually, we know we need to diversify our content. We know we need to diversify our audiences. But really, we feel this urgency around diversifying our staff. And so we came back and said, well, if we need to get to the place of diversifying their audiences and content, it feels like maybe we could get there faster by helping them diversify their staff. And so we launched 
a B2B recruitment, coaching, um, and executive placement arm. And that, in year one, allowed us to generate the revenue could, to then build the operations of the rest of the organization. The quarter that Sarah's talking about was significant because that was the quarter that advertising overtook revenue in um, revenue generation, which was, in, sorry, re re recruitment over, advertising overtook recruitment um, in generating revenue. And that felt like, oh my goodness, we have built a diversified revenue model. And so that was, that, that to me is a success story. The last thing I'll just mention, uh, well, two things. One is our staff is now 12 people. And so the ability to build a team um, that feels purposeful and is pulled from some of the biggest brands across the world is a success story. And the last thing I'll say is when our partners come to us and say, um, we had no revenue plan and suddenly URL comes in and 50% of our advertising budget is through URL, and now we have advertising on our website or our newsletters to show prospective clients. To me, that's a success story because we're um, handing that sustainability off to the partner organizations. Uh, McKinsey's a happy customer of their recruiting. <laughs> uh, they've brought us some very diverse and amazing uh, candidates, Thank actually. Thank you, Roger. So, um, this is an international audience. You're a very American-based organization. Uh, 20 sounds amazing, but 20 covers very little of the yeah, US. That's right. So what does the roadmap look like? And is there an opportunity or an ambition to figure out a way to get international members to become part of the network? Yeah, I mean, um, so we always say that we launched with a national plan with global ambitions. We've always, from our inception, our intention has been to be global. So, um, but again, we needed to refine and test and uh, figure out our model in the US before we began to expand um, internationally. So our, our roadmap is that we are looking to grow to about 30 uh, media organizations in 2023 and then ramp it up to about 100 within the next like three to four years. And that, as we expand uh, to that larger number, that would include international um, media organizations as well. What does it take to be considered somebody you would want to bring onto the network? Um, so we have a form that uh, potential partners fill out. Um, it, it, it's questions like, um, do you have the ability to take advertising? What's your audience size? Um, it's, it's, it, what's your frequency of publication? I mean, so those are sorts of the um, uh, parameters that we're looking at. Um, I just want to mention one other thing on the global piece, and this kind of gets to um, who gets to be a partner. Um, it's impossible to be a black and brown network in America without having a global strategy. I think much of local news is bordered, and the truth of our communities is that they're global uh, by their very presence in the United States in many cases. Um, so we find that some of our partners, the Haitian Times, for example, comes to mind. Um, some of the best journalism being committed in the countries um, that our partners come from are actually occurring outside of the country just because of different um, security reasons or the ability uh, to, to kind of be a free press and so forth. So I, um, I do think that for us, there's something that's already been inherently global. And as we're expanding, the other piece, um, I think Sarah was alluding to this, is um, trying to be at about 20 million users. Right now we're at about 12 million. Um, we'd like to be at 20 million by the end of the year with that 30 number. They're telling us to wrap can, it up can, quiet, we, so. can we take any questions? I'm asking the guy in the back. <laughs> While we're doing that, um, each of you, obviously this is about news you can use. What is the one thing that this audience can do for you after mm. having heard this? And what's the one thing you can do for this audience in addition to saying if you're interested, apply to be a part of the network? Sure. I would say sign up for our newsletter. Yeah. Go to url-media.com uh, and sign up for our newsletter. I think there's, we, we didn't really talk about the advertising education piece. I think that's so critical uh, that we are still in a scale game when it comes to advertising. We're still basing this on web impressions when nobody's going to web, at least in our communities, 
when I, I shouldn't say nobody's going to websites, but they're going to WhatsApp and they're on the radio and they're calling Sarah's radio station. And so I feel like I'm on like an education campaign for what it will take for us to measure the impact of our organizations, but also to educate uh, potential advertisers on the value that our communities represent. And I would also say, you know, this is a journalism conference, so, you know, learn more about us, but then share it, spread the word, and let people know that we exist and that we're doing this work and, you know, that um, we have something that we hope is replicable and is shareable, not just um, in the U.S., but, again, out into the world. So. They I don't are, know if there are any questions. They no, are they, us oh, off. they're cutting us. Okay. Um, sorry. Both of them will be available for the next three yep. days. The best way to catch them is if you show up at about ten o'clock in the Brofani bar, <laughs> they'll they'll be there, right? Um, if but, you buy drinks, we'll be there at two a.m. too. <laughs> just saying. Yeah. Yeah. They gave us. Even the... though they're for profit. Um, <laughs> That's thanks, true. everyone. Really appreciate thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please keep coming. So tired of talking about